a major weather disaster unfolding in Acapulco in Mexico. Hurricane Otis made landfall around 1 in the morning as a Category 5 storm. Winds at landfall were 165 miles an hour with a 923 millibar pressure. Back on Monday, the official NHC forecast had it remaining a tropical storm with 55 knot winds. Yesterday morning, the forecast was brought up to 80 knots, and gradually by yesterday evening, it was brought up to 140 knots. So this is a forecast error that will certainly be studied for years to come. Reportedly, communications to the city are still out, but fortunately the storm is well inland and the rescue and cleanup work can begin. Closer to home, here's how things look in the U.S. and Canada. A shift into winter. Yeah, take a look at that up there in the prairies, Montana. We've got Arctic air coming straight south. Temperatures at this hour around Billings down to 18 degrees, 15 at Great Falls, and 20s in northern North Dakota. And you'll notice that I've got this divided into two main frontal zones. The primary polar front is located from Lake Michigan down through Iowa, Kansas, and then back around into around Idaho, northern Nevada. And it divides these 50s and 60s in the Rocky Mountain region from 40s and 30s. And you can see that thickness gradient, the banded red lines right there. And then we have the secondary boundary. That's going to be the Arctic air coming south. And some of that Arctic air breaching the Bitterroot Range. We have winds out of the east and northern Idaho and around Spokane, 35 degrees, with snow there. So certainly some inclement weather. So let's take a look at the northeastern U.S. They're underneath this large anticyclone covering the eastern part of the country. Temperatures coming up into the 70s, pretty far north, all the way up into Buffalo, almost to London, Ontario, and to near Toronto. Looking at 71 in southern New Hampshire and 70 at Windsor Locks. No advisories to speak of anywhere in the northeastern U.S., although there are small craft advisories off of southern Massachusetts. In the southeastern U.S., a similar story. We've got stout easterly flow from the Atlantic. Temperatures mild, 70s all the way up into Georgia and over to Mississippi, where we're picking up a few 80s. No warnings, no advisories in that part of the country either, but small craft advisories throughout many areas of Florida on up towards the Carolinas. And then shifting over to Texas, still dealing with the remnants of Hurricane Norma. That's some of that moisture there, and some of it is being wrapped up with moisture coming out of the Caribbean, heading straight north. And you can see those dew points there, very sultry, up into the 70s, all the way up in Oklahoma. And we're almost to November, so we should start seeing some of that moisture letting off a bit. But not yet. It is still very much like, uh, say, a late summer pattern. And we've even got a dry line right there in the Texas Panhandle dividing this drier air at Tucumcari, Dowhart, Clayton from the very rich air out to the west. Then we've got this old cold frontal boundary if you look at the thickness lines, there's a little cold pocket aloft. Some cooler temperatures around El Paso, Las Cruces, and Deming. So I'm drawing that little cold front right there, but I think that's just going to kind of stall out there in Texas and serve as a boundary for continued development over the next day or two. Anyway, for today, we do have an SPC marginal risk for severe storms from Fort Worth down into the Texas Hill Country, right in that area there. You can see that MCS out there to the west. We do have flash flood warnings in effect between Junction and Sonora. So that kind of fills you in if you're in that part of the country. In the northern plains, well, we're going to lump North Dakota in with the northwestern U.S., so we're going to cover that in a minute. But elsewhere, Extensive fog through South Dakota into Nebraska, down into the Corn Belt. And we do have dense fog advisories in parts of far northeastern South Dakota. In the southwestern U.S., 
a mild day, 72 at Las Vegas, 76 at Phoenix. But the marine layer, yeah, take a look at this marine layer working into Los Angeles, bringing that thick stratus all the way up to the mountains. And that's kind of the opposite of the Santa Ana pattern, where you have high pressure in Nevada, low pressure offshore, and that drives dry air offshore. This is an onshore component, and as you can see on the weather map there, it is the opposite of the Santa Ana pattern. Low pressure in Nevada with high pressure offshore. So as we get later into fall, you're going to see some examples of that Santa Ana pattern, and conditions tend to be very clear away from any forest fire smoke that is going. All right, let's take a look out in the Pacific. I forgot to draw this high pressure area. We do have an atmospheric river working on shore into Northern California and spreading across the Great Basin area. IVT values about 300 to 400 and more towards 500 offshore. And that's important because it's driving this winter storm that we've got going across the Northwest. This is the water vapor imagery upper level low across Washington. In the coastal ranges, we've got winter storm warnings in the higher elevations, mostly above 3,000 feet, 4 to 10 inches of snow possible there. Winter weather advisories in the northeastern half of Washington and freeze warnings and frost advisories through the rest of the state. In Idaho, winter weather advisories as well. Idaho City up to Stanley and places northward. But the big problems with winter weather are in Montana, and that's where that cold air advection is forming this wedge of very cold temperatures. Throughout much of Montana, looking for five to nine inches of snow. And in North Dakota, the entire state except the far east under a winter storm warning as well. And that goes all the way until Friday. I've often stressed the importance of supplies if you're traveling in the northern states in winter. Food, blanket, power bank. No one ever expects to be stranded in a survival situation, but it does happen in these big storms. Emergency responders may be unavailable, immobile, or working at a slow speed due to weather, so you do have to be self-sufficient. And heading on up into Alaska, high pressure, finally clearing that winter weather away from that part of the continent. There are heavy spray warnings well offshore up there in the Chukchi Sea, gale warnings off of Cold Bay, but everywhere else in Alaska looking really good. Temperatures very nippy though, 8 degrees just southeast of Fairbanks and 5 degrees at Dawson. And then on the other side of that, we've got strong cold air advection sweeping through the Northwest Territories and into Victoria Island. But 27 degrees right there, that's not too bad. It could definitely be a lot worse. And I think part of that is due to that warm air, which has kind of wrapped around the north side of this Hudson Bay low over the period of like three or four days. And that's kind of moderated the air mass in that region. So definitely much colder as you go out west. And then this is more under the Atlantic and Labrador Sea influence. There's that Hudson Bay low, 994 millibars on that. And then we see that anti-cyclone ridging on down into the prairies. And look at that right there in British Columbia in the interior region, the Fraser River Valley. Very cold. 16 degrees, and that's with sunshine. Some of that being blocked by the mountains, but some very uh, breezy, very cold, frigid weather down through Vancouver and into some of the southern towns. All right. And I think that is the Grand Tour, just rain and occlusion there in Quebec. And that's pretty much everything. A quick look at our tropical weather. There's the remnants of Otis moving on up to the north. And the Atlantic, we've got Hurricane Tammy, which is 90 knots, which makes it a Category 2 storm. That's not really going to be much of a factor. Heading on up to the northwest towards Bermuda very slowly and weakening. 
Here's how it looks on the GFS run. Plenty of blocking to the northwest, so Tammy does not make much headway. As we go into the weekend, weakening on Tammy. And then we develop this disturbed area of weather around the Dominican Republic, Haiti, eastern Cuba. Another front heads to the south through Florida, through the western Atlantic, but we do get some sort of development down there around Haiti, at least according to the GFS. You know, this could be just crystal ball stuff. We're 210 hours out. This is Friday next week, and it's going for a closed low, maybe a tropical storm there around the Bahamas, but I wouldn't put too much stock into that. Then we... The only thing that we know for sure is that there could be potential for something in this area later next week. So we'll just continue to watch that, and probably by Monday, things should be a little bit more clear. Looking at the upper-level charts, we do have an omega block across the eastern Pacific. So the long wave pattern is locked up to a certain extent. One big change that we're going to be seeing is a big ramp up in the atmospheric momentum. Look at this as we get into next week. Starting to see blue colors, which represents 150 knots and above. So the jet stream definitely strengthening across the eastern U.S. And we also open up this northwesterly flow, which tends to be cold in the Midwest, in the Northern Plains and the Great Lakes area. It can be that way for the rest of the country. It really depends exactly how this trough sets itself up. If we have that trough axis a little bit further east, like you see right here, that can be pretty cold across much of the central part of the country. And I do think we will be seeing 30s and 40s in the northern plains and probably 50s all the way down towards Texas. Anyway, we break up that blocking out to the west, some ridging across the western U.S., and then going into the later part of the week, it is a progressive weather pattern. Strong jet coming in from the Central Pacific, and that crashes onto the West Coast as we get towards next weekend. So we're heading back into a typical El Nino pattern around midweek next week. So let's take a look at the short-term weather pattern. Plenty of wintry weather up to the north across the bitter roots across Idaho and North Dakota. Going to the overnight hours, cold air continues to sink southward. By tomorrow afternoon, there's how things are looking. Cold air has made progress into Nebraska, into Wyoming. That's a little bit further south than had been forecast, and some of that cold air moving into Nevada as well. Going into Friday, as we return for the next weathercast, the cold air has made it into the Great Plains. That's going to be the cold front. The Pacific segment, a little bit further to the east. Highs will be in the 80s across Texas. And the northeastern U.S. seeing 70s and 80s as well. Up to 81 degrees at Washington, D.C. Then going into Saturday, there's the map for Saturday afternoon. Cold air infiltrating Nevada, leading edge still around Grand Junction to Los Angeles, but the Canadian segment has worked all the way into Texas and starting to move into Ohio and Kentucky. So we switch over to the GFS. Those are going to be the key fronts right there. And there's going to be a big push of that cold air on Sunday. There's Sunday afternoon. It's already moved through much of Texas and has started to infiltrate Arizona and Southern California as well. Highs will be a lot colder on Sunday, down from 72 Saturday to 65 at Las Vegas, down to 80 from 85 at Phoenix, and down to 58 from 73 at Albuquerque. Then on Monday, cold across much of the country, that cold air all the way down towards Georgia, down towards the Carolinas, and this is all a big thermal trough across the Great Lakes. Highs are going to be in the 40s in Lubbock in Midland, Texas, 52 at DFW, 
and highs will be in the 70s in Arizona, which in itself is a big change from a couple weeks ago. And that'll do it for this edition of Forecast Lab. On a lot of YouTube videos, you hear people say to like, comment, and subscribe. I hardly ever ask that favor of my viewers, but I want to go ahead and ask that now. Please go ahead and press the like button, please comment, and please subscribe. At least do two of those things. I'd appreciate that. And of course, I want to thank our Patreon supporters. A lot of you have been with me over the past five years or so. Some of you have just signed up. Whatever the case, you all are very important to this program. I appreciate each and one of you for your contributions to this channel. All right, let me go ahead and wrap it up and get on out of here. Thank you very much, and we'll see you back here in two days for the Friday edition. Hope you have a great one. Bye-bye.